Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the chart reading tutorial webinar. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Mark Lawrenson, and I'm the principal of Sydney Astrology School. And what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be doing another chart reading tutorial webinar in response to the first one that I did, uh, where many, many people have emailed me and said, can you please, please, please do another one? And so, okay, this is it. And what better time to do it than in the time where everybody is at home, locked away and uh, wanting to learn all about astrology. So before we get stuck into the actual uh, reading that we're going to be doing uh, today, I just want to um, just let you all know about a mini course that's coming up. Um, it's a mini course that I'm calling um, Past Life, the, uh, the Past Life mini course. And it is going to be on uh, compiling the nodal story, bringing the nodal story together. And it's going to be a five week mini course uh, starting at the very beginning of May. So it'll be the 3rd of May here in Australia. It'll be the 2nd of May um, in America and Europe. And it's going to be five weeks. So we're going to be doing uh, five webinars, five weekly webinars with pulling all the, the nodes, the rulers of the nodes, all the aspects to the nodes and pulling the whole story together because that's a fundamental and very, very important part of an astrology reading. And to be able to do it well and to be able to do it efficiently, um, I, I, I believe uh, makes a really, really, really good astrologer. So I hope you can join us for that. Okay, so before we get stuck into the reading, the uh, tutorial, um, this is this is going to be a, a tutorial. So I'm going to be teaching you how to pull a chart together bit by bit. Many, many people know a lot about astrology. You know, they know a lot about the signs. They know a lot about the planets. They know a lot about the houses. But when it comes to actually sitting down and saying, well, give me a reading, well, that's a different story. People have trouble. People have trouble being able to piece it all together, um, being able to see what relates to what and make sense of it. Now, what we're going to be doing in uh, in this webinar is just that, is being able to, to pull it all together bit by bit like we're painting a tapestry, so to speak. So it makes not only, not only are you starting to see a story come together, but it makes sense to the client as well. As astrologers, we have a huge responsibility because um, we have, we do have a person's life in our hands, uh, literally. Um, this is their sole intention story. This is what they've come here to experience. Um, and it's up to us as astrologers to be able to relay the information in a way uh, that's going to be empowering and purposeful and useful and make it clear to them. So we have to be very, very careful and very, we, as I said, we have to be conscious of how um, how the, the client is receiving this information. So in this tutorial, I'm also going to be doing that. I'm also going to be uh, letting you know um, how to put the um, the messages that are coming through in the chart across to the client so the client can actually uh, take them on board and go, oh, wow, I get that, you know, the penny dropping stuff, you know, and even the things that might look challenging in charts. Um, I call them sacred hurdles because uh, when I see uh, uh, lots of so-called challenging aspects, I think, oh, this is really good because when I see that, it makes me feel like these people are bringing stuff into their life for them to grow, for them to develop. And it feels like the challenges that are brought in are actually going to be um, holy in some kind of way because once we've jumped the sacred hurdle, once we've overcome it, once we feel like we've, we've mastered something and moved past it, it feels like we've made ground in our development. And so um, that's how you have to phrase it in, in our, our reading as well, rather than actually going, oh, there's a square or there's a quincunx and, you know, get all frightened about it and relay it in that kind of way and scare the client. You have to relay it in a positive way where the challenge actually becomes workable for them. And so this is what this is all about. This is what this uh, particular webinar is all about, to understand the chart on that level and to be able to, uh, uh, as I said, be able to 
to put the information out in a way where a client is actually going to leave feeling so, so much better than when they came in. And that's what it's all about. So let's get stuck into the actual reading that we're going to be doing today. So in, can we put the chart up, please? So here it is. So a lot of you are probably reeling back <laughs> in your chairs all of a sudden because you've just noticed something that looks very dramatic. And it is. It is very dramatic. But really, when you look at it, it could go anyway. And it could go anyway. How long have we been live for, Peter? We've just started. Yeah. You always have to remember, too, this is, this is primary stuff to remember, everybody, that a chart is not good or bad. A chart is neutral. A chart is a splash of energy that somebody has chosen to work with this particular lifetime. It's their journey that they've chosen. And it's up to them with making it into either a good life or a not so good life. And so you have to explain this to clients when they come to you as well, that as astrologers, there's nothing in the astrology chart that says something bad is going to happen or something good is going to happen. The ball is in the client's in the client's court with how they're going to be playing it. So we as astrologers don't know how something is going to turn out. It's up to the up to the person who's playing their chart with how that is going to work out for them. They could actually step up to the plate and do some amazing stuff with their life, or they can run around, run away from it and they can resist it and they can just find it all too hard. And this doesn't make them bad. It's not about good or bad, but it's a difference between living a life that feels fulfilling and living a life that you feel, you know, not necessarily you've wasted, but you, you'd probably feel depressed or frustrated about. That's the difference. So what I normally say at the very beginning is what hits you first when you look at this chart, okay? <laughs> now, this is an obvious one because your eyes are going to go straight to that big Scorpio stellium. I know that, and that's the obvious. That's the obvious thing that takes your takes your attention. But um, I want to go outside the stellium because when I get a chart with a big stellium like that, I take the stellium in. Of course, you can't not. But my eyes tend to go elsewhere. My eyes tend to go the, to the planets outside of the stellium because the planets outside of the stellium are actually going to be stronger in many ways. Now, when you're going to be looking at uh, a hemispheric emphasis, um, you're going to be noticing um, something really important here as well. Can everybody see just about all the planets are in the upper hemisphere? And there's only one planet in the lower hemisphere, including the south node, of course, but only one planet in the lower hemisphere. And Ingrid is circling it, and it's Saturn. Saturn is the only planet in the bottom hemisphere, and so Saturn is going to be a focalizer because of that. It's a singleton. It's going to be a focalizer, the only planet in the lower hemisphere by itself. So Saturn will play out very, very strongly in this person's life and in the reading itself. So if you want to start dividing the, the houses up into quadrants, you're going to notice a very, very strong fourth quadrant. Everyone see the quadrant? Uh, the fourth quadrant from 10 to 12 is pretty much jam-packed. And so the fourth quadrant is the quadrant of integration, everybody. This is where a person, um, a person's uh, life force, identity, person's sense of self is directed out into the world publicly. It's integrated out into the world publicly and socially. And there's something about needing to be part of something uh, bigger than just themselves. And so you see in this particular chart, um, there is a, a lot of um, a lot of emphasis there. Now, this is the chart of one of my students. 
Um, I, I haven't actually met her. She's an online student. And, um, and what I, she, um, she's, I asked her if I could use it and she said that I could. Now, uh, the date, the date of her, so I don't have the date up there. So most of you, if you've got pens and papers ready, I'll give you the date of this chart. Oh, there it is. Thanks, Ian. It's the 4th of November, 1994, at 10.23 a.m., 10.23 in the morning, in Perth, Western Australia. There, Ingrid's written it down for everybody. Okay. So the other hemispheres are, are relatively quiet. That doesn't mean that they're inactive, of course. Nothing is really inactive in the chart, even untenanted houses, houses that don't have any, uh, any planets in them are still active by the sign on the cusp. And the ruler, you know, the ruling planet of the sign on the cusp will activate that particular house. Now, I use Placidus um, uh, houses, everybody. Uh, I'll, that's, uh, that's the system that I use. It's been um, the most accurate system for me. I've tried many systems throughout my career, um, and I always come back to Placidus. Placidus just uh, feels right, and as I said, it's the most accurate, most accurate with birth charts, and it's also the most accurate with transits and progressions as well. So all my all, all the charts that I'll be putting up are all going to um, going to be Placidus. Now let's have a look at the emphasis and the uh, lack so to speak, of modes and elements. Okay, so let's start off with the elements. And so you can see a really, really strong emphasis of water, of course, all the Scorpio planets in water, um, Saturn's in Pisces. So strong emphasis in water and Earth. You've got the... the uh, You've got Uranus and Neptune in Capricorn. You've got Chiron in Virgo. Uh, south Node also in Taurus. So I, I often count, count the South Node when I'm looking at elemental emphasis because the South Node is a, an element that they bring in. And so here is kind of like a, a very, very strong Earth water emphasis, isn't it? Um, one planet in fire, which is Mars. Um, and one planet in air, which is Mercury. So very strong earth water. So it's it's a very yin chart, isn't it? Very yin, earth water. Um, and uh, from this, all the Scorpio, uh, you get a strength going on there. It's strong yin energy. Now, don't think just because there's only one planet in fire and one planet in air that this is lacking. Often... Often when you lack a particular element, you'll either bring it in, you'll bring it into your life through other people, so there'll be a lot of that in your life, but sometimes when something is lacking, there's an over, there's an almost like a, an over a production of it in somebody's life. It feels like they, they have to, um, they have to uh, put a lot of emphasis on that particular area. So, for instance, there could be a lot of emphasis in the Mars area of her life as it's the only fire. There could be a lot of emphasis also on the um, Mercury area because it's the only air. So don't think there's a lack in this person's personality. It could actually, those particular areas could actually show uh, quite, a, quite, a strong, quite a strong energy in those particular uh, elements. Now let's have a look at the modes. It's very fixed, isn't it? Extremely fixed. Of course, all the the Scorpio planets uh, come out with the with fixed. Of course, um, Mars is in a fixed sign. Mars is in Leo. The South Node, the nodal axis, is fixed. So you go down the road of some of a of a very uh, strong, determined. Uh, deliberate, um, enduring energy. Uh, this can work really, really well when it's on track, so to speak, but can be a little bit challenging for people 
um, when they need to uh, to be adaptable or move with things. Uh, fix can get quite obsessive in certain areas of their life. And so they have to be very careful about where this gets directed. Because as I said, this can be really, really um, positive um, if it's directed well, because it's a diehard kind of energy going on here, especially with all those Scorpio planets. Now, um, she's got Cardinal in uh, Uranus and Neptune, um, and uh, that's it, isn't it? And she's got Mutable in uh, Saturn and Chiron. So again, a, a lesser a lesser degree of emphasis on those, but again, I wouldn't say uh, that she lacks them. Um, they're still there, they're still in her chart and they will be used in certain ways in her life, okay? So when you think of it, it's, it's very yin, it's more fixed water. Fixed water, of course, is Scorpio. So that big stellium up there in Scorpio really, really uh, dominates the energy as far as the mode and the element is concerned as well. Okay, so I picked I picked a uh, a chart with a stellium in it, and that's why I asked my student if I could use this particular chart because of this stellium. Only because I think that when people see stelliums, when people see a chart with a stellium like this, or even a stellium of maybe four planets. A lot of people get overwhelmed by a stellium. They think, you know, they get bamboozled by this amount of energy uh, in one particular sign and one particular house and don't really know what to do with it. Uh, many people might think, um, many people might think this is going to be a really quick reading because all the planets are saying the same thing. You know, they're saying the same thing in the same way in the same area of, of the chart. So, so I can't really make a lot out of this, you know, and then, and I've got a reading for two hours and then there's this huge stellium that I can really discuss with the person in 10 minutes. And so, you know, it might that that might go through somebody's mind. But I want to tell you that there couldn't be anything more off track than thinking like that, because there is something about a stellium that talks about the same kind of thing. But there is so much going on with the stellium in so many different ways because every planet, every planet has their own agenda. Every planet has a different function. And even though the planets are all banned together, you really still have to look at them in that way. You still have to look at them individually as well. And you also have to remember that every single planet rules another house cusp. So all the house cusps that look like they're they're, they're almost, um, I was going to say inanimate, you know, that kind of feeling, um, are alive, are actually alive by the stellium as well. So that's another thing you can actually bring in. You can actually bring in the other other houses and how they are, how they are activated by the planets in the stellium, okay? So let's get started. In, let's start looking at the, the big three, or the big four, I should say. The big three are the sun, moon, and the ascendant, the primal triad, of course. But the big four are the sun, moon, and ascendant, and nodal axis. And that's what I look at first. I don't look at anything else until I get my head around sun, moon, ascendant, and nodal axis. And then any planets that are involved with that. And then I build the story out from there, okay? So this is a good way of being able to, to start to pull yourself back, you know, away from the chart. Um, and when I say away from the chart, I mean away from the, the feeling of you getting swallowed up by that great big stellium and start to pull it away from the chart and then start to see it bit by bit. And so here is the beginning, the foundation, and we'll start to build from that. Okay, so the sun and the moon are both in Scorpio. So there's a double whammy here. She's a double Scorpio, sun and moon. So the life force energy of the sun and the emotional needs and the emotional nourishment and the emotional joy and love of the moon are both dealing with Scorpio, with being Scorpio this particular lifetime. 
and having to go through what Scorpio is all about. Scorpio has an objective. Scorpio has an agenda. So get that into your head to start off with, okay? And then we've got to look at the house that it's in. They're both in the 10th house, everybody. But I want to, I want to actually, I want to actually bring the moon maybe a little bit closer to the 11th. It's still in the 10th, but I want to bring it a little bit closer to the 11th. Now, my rule of thumb is that if a planet is in within two degrees of the following house, the house it's about to move into, then I start to read it into the following house. Some people say five degrees. I've heard of more traditional astrologers say five degrees. Um, I wouldn't go that wide, um, but I think two degrees is, is, is enough. And so also I, I like to look at the Pluto and the Jupiter in the 11th house, kind of pulling the moon in with it, if you know what I mean, even though the moon does play out singly as well. But I can't help but think the moon has got it like a 10th or 11th house flavour. And so here, the 10th house, the 10th house has a very, very strong uh, uh, dominant energy in uh, this girl's life. And the 10th house is all about your path in the world. It's all about you having a mission of sorts. So get that in your mind before you, you move on. Now, let's have a quick look at the ascendant. The ascendant is in Capricorn, a very goal oriented, very determined very concentrated, very focused ascendant. And the ruler of the ascendant is that singleton down there in the second house. It is Saturn. So the Saturn is, as I said, the only planet in the bottom hemisphere. So it's going to be very, very strong in her chart. So to me, it feels almost like an anchor down there in the bottom hemisphere. It kind of anchors the chart in a way. And because it's part of her, because it's part of her, um, her identity, um, she needs this. I feel that she needs this to be able to keep herself on track. I think this is really handy for her and I would let her know that. Now, the big thing that I'm getting from this, and this is where I want to actually start, everybody, is the nodal axis. Can everybody see how the north node is in the middle of the stellium. And so the whole stellium, particularly Sun, Moon and Venus, particularly Sun, Moon and Venus, play out in the nodal story, so to speak. They're on the North Node. These are planets that she has to incorporate. These are planets that she has to integrate. These are relatively new planets for her. They're North Node planets. They're relatively new for her this particular lifetime. So she has to develop them and develop them well. But any planets on the North Node, everybody, played against the South Node. So she knows these planets, even though they might be new for her to integrate into herself, into her personality, into who she is, she's known them before as planets that played against her. Isn't this interesting? You're getting a story before we even start. Her south node is in uh, Taurus. Now, I won't, be, I won't be answering any questions at the moment, everybody. So um, if you're writing stuff, that's fine, but don't expect me to answer them until the end of the uh, webinar only because it'll, it'll take me off track a little bit and I want to stay on track for the sake of the, of the learning. So um, the, the south node, of course, is in the opposite sign to all the Scorpio planets. It's in Taurus, down there in the fourth house, in the opposite sign in the opposite house. Now, this is a really, for me, when I see this, this is a really good starting point for me because it gives me an understanding of the story of, of, of where she was before, of course, with the South Node, but also how she's going to be dealing with the rest of her chart, especially the Scorpio stellium in this lifetime as well. So it's really good, it's really good leverage 
And I feel that when we, when, if you were looking at this chart, I think this would be great. It would give you so many clues about her Scorpioness that you can actually run with, knowing it's coming from a South Nodi uh, storyline. It becomes really, really important. Okay, so let's let's start to get into that. We've kind of we've kind of established the main things. Oh, well, there's another thing that I want to bring up before we get into it is Mars. Everybody see Mars over there in the seventh in Leo, a very, very strong Mars. Can everyone see how it squares the nodal axis? Making an almost exact square by one degree. So there you go. There's another planet that played out big in the nodal story that she has to deal with again in this lifetime. And a square is called, Jeffrey Wolf Green calls it the skip step the planet that really aggravated you, vexed you, pissed you off, um, could have been aggressive towards you if it's because it's Mars, you know, that kind of thing, that she has to turn around in this particular lifetime and work with in a positive way. So there's another clue towards Mars as well to be able to help you pull, uh, pull the chart together and be able to bring it into her life. So let's look south node in Taurus, okay, south node in Taurus in the fourth house. Past life energy brings in something around safety, safety, security, safety, security, stability, predictability, grounding, buckling down. Maybe there's a, an element of holding on to something. Taurus holds on to something. Is money involved in this? You know, is that feeling of, of, of security and safety around money? Maybe people who didn't have it, you know, that feeling and having to, to uh, try and survive or maybe just people who were, who, where, where money was important to them and uh, that, was their, that was their idea of being able to um, uh, keep their head above water in this lifetime. So you get a feeling of that, that safety mechanism, that whole idea of being able to stay as secure as possible was big in the past life. Interesting how she's coming as a Scorpio this life, which is about being totally unsafe. But anyway, we'll get to that in a sec. So it's fourth house, family, home, past foundational stuff, emotional foundational stuff. And so here is everything to do with home and family and the safety of the home and family, the, the, the security of the home and family, that feeling of being uh, part of a clan, part of a group, part of a tribe, uh, where there's emotional neediness involved in this. You know, that feeling of I depend on you emotionally, you depend on me emotionally. And because it's Taurus, maybe there's money thrown into this. I depend on your money, you depend on my money. It's about keeping the family safe with this kind of stuff. And there's a feeling with, with the fourth house of not being able to be identified outside of being a family member kind of thing. And so maybe you are a provider, maybe you are a pr pr protector. Any of those things would come into it. But that whole feeling, that whole feeling of keeping everything um, moving uh, slowly and evenly, the status quo, um, the whole idea of not letting anything come in to disrupt things uh, becomes very, very strong. Um, and that need to be behind closed doors, you know, that need to be in an environment um, away from life. Um, could have this been days where women, you know, back in the day, where women's only place was in the home and where women probably couldn't make money of their own, that kind of thing, and relied on family money or relied on money or maybe had to be the provider for the family on that level in coming with all, all those kind of ideas. Now, to make it even more juicy, we've got to start looking at the planets that are involved in her nodal story. And so the planets that are involved are the ruler of the South Node. The ruler of the South Node is Venus. Venus is the ruler of Taurus. Everyone see Venus? Look where she is. 
Venus is up there in the 10th house. She's in Scorpio and she's conjunct the sun. And so this is an extension of who she was. So she's not just Taurus in the fourth. She's also an extension of her is in the in the 10th, in, in the Scorpio stellium. So when I see Venus, I often look at partnership. I often think, is this her partner? Is this her husband? Is this her lover? And so it looks like she might have been married to somebody. Let's go there next to the sun. She might have been married to somebody who was in a position, who was, um, who was powerful, you know, that kind of feeling, who was powerful, um, and who might have uh, had uh, some kind of clout, you know, the sun. Um, being strong and being uh, and being such a, a, a magnanimous force, it feels almost like that this person may have been popular on the outside, but who knows what it was like at home because it's Scorpio. So her marriage, her marriage played against her. Everyone kind of get that? Her marriage played against her. Who she married played against her. Her married life played against her. Here she is at home trying to keep secure with a husband, with a strong husband who looked like he was in control in the authority area. Did everyone get that? Her marriage controlled her. She was being controlled by a partner or she was being controlled by uh, another, uh, a, a, a person who she was romantically, romantically uh, engaged with, that kind of thing. You can also see it in another way too. You can also see it as maybe she had passion. And I, I, I want to add this to it. You know, I don't want to make it either or. I want to add this to it. Maybe she had passion. You know, maybe it, it, it's Venus in Scorpio and the sun in Scorpio. Maybe she had a particular talent. Maybe she had an artistic gift or she was passionate and maybe she did want to get out into the world and maybe she did want to show it off, but she wasn't allowed to. Could this be in the days where women were not allowed to shine? They had to stay at home and they had to keep house, you know, in a very Torian kind of way. So that's another thing that comes into it because anything against the South Node has a feeling of either playing against as a blockage or an opposition, or if it's a if it's a planet like Venus, um, it could actually be something that you you craved or you wanted and couldn't have. You know that kind of feeling, and so you get that you get that with the with the Venus and the Sun as well. Maybe it was a bit of both. Now another interesting one is the Moon. And I can't help but bring the sun in a little bit with this, but I'm looking mainly at the moon. And I'm guessing I'm going to go down the road, the moon in the 10th. Is everyone coming out with mother? <laughs> in a storyline context, Scorpio, it looks like, again, it looks like a family person and it looks like mum in the past life and possibly in this one as well. Also in the 10th house, a dominant, uh, powerful uh, mother also plays into this, into this keeping her in her place, so to speak, as well. So that is something that she's going to have to deal with in this particular lifetime when she turns the moon around. It feels like maybe with mothers, you know, there's a with, with, with fixed signs, especially, uh, especially, there's a loyalty factor that goes on with fixed signs. And sometimes we're loyal to the wrong people. You know, we're loyal to a, loyal to a family or loyal to a mother just because of who they are and not necessarily because you respect them. And so there's that feeling of loyalty that comes in with this, maybe loyal to the family, maybe loyal to her mother, but her mother possibly controlled her in some way or overpowered or had power over her in some way. You get that feeling of the, the moon opposition. You know, I love to play around with stories a little bit, not saying that this actually happened, but could mother have been part of her um, being married off to this guy? Only because the moon rules the seventh house? 
Can anyone see cancers on the seventh house cusp? Maybe there's something going on there between mother and relationship, that kind of thing, the linkage. So maybe she had something to do with the need for her daughter to marry somebody like that. So you get a feeling all of a sudden that these Scorpio planets played out against her in a controlling, powerful, possibly intimidating way. Possibly she was coerced. Maybe she was manipulated. But, you know, her she plays into this as well because can everyone see that her Venus is there too? So maybe maybe in in her um in her married life maybe in her married life there was a little bit of um of a soap opera you know going on um and maybe it was something that she had to deal with in the way of maintaining a, a sense of her personal value while she you know which is venus and and also the sun while she was in uh situations where other people uh where other people held held the reins so to speak had the, or had the authority this could have been really challenging for her on that level uh particularly around if she felt that she had something to offer and nobody uh nobody would uh allow her to express it that would have been very very difficult for her now there is something else going on with with the square and that's the mars okay so this this makes it even more um, this makes it even more specific, doesn't it? The Mars in Leo coming in from the seventh house. This is all past life stuff I'm I'm talking about now, but I'm only I'm only bringing it up this early, and because most of her planets are involved. So with the Mars in Leo, when Mars in Leo, this is this is a very very big grand um and when i look at it it looks like very dominating looks like a very dominating uh signature doesn't it it feels uh like it could be quite aggressive it could actually get quite violent and it looks very egocentric very egotistical um you might might want to go down the road of narcissism you know all those kind of feelings and this is in the seventh house so this adds more to the story of the partner or the husband that was aggressive that scared her that intimidated her that stopped her that stopped her from doing things that lorded over her that held her back that thwarted her you get that feeling don't you because of also of the Venus Sun in opposition, and then you've got Mars, you've got her feeling quite trapped and quite scared. It's very scary, very intimidating. And so her need to remain down in the fourth house, her need to remain safe is not just about um, money and security on the material level but it feels like an emotion a, a strong emotional need for safety at, that she she possibly never got or she possibly never had because there's so many things outside things that are playing um are playing against her to make her feel um make her feel uh less than insignificant unimportant and frightened very very frightened mars energy scorpio energy against you probably coerced as i said manipulated now i don't want to get too saucy with this but you can't help but bring sex into this as well in a way where maybe maybe there was areas sexually because we're talking mars and we're talking scorpio areas sexually where she where she was compromised i'll just leave it at that as well that may have left a scar of sorts interesting how she's come back with this with this huge stellium in scorpio isn't it to deal with stuff like that this particular lifetime now knowing that knowing that what's going on there knowing knowing that full story as a backstory to what's going on in this particular lifetime you can now 
start the chart from scratch knowing where level one left off. Not level one, series one, but level one, but series one left off. And we're moving into series two. We're moving into this particular lifetime. So she comes back in to this particular lifetime with this huge Scorpio stellium that she had to deal with that was against her before. So before we start looking at the planets involved, let's just talk Scorpio just for a minute. Let's just talk Scorpio. And let's talk Scorpio outside of the um, of the usual uh, n usual things around personality traits. Scorpio is the sign that comes into this lifetime to become fearless, to become emotionally fearless in situations that it deems is out of its control. That's what Scorpio is all about. So Scorpio is about trying to uh, trying to acquire power based on being able to look fear in the face with things that we feel we cannot deal with or we cannot handle. Now, that's a huge ask, isn't it? Because what are these things that are out of our control that Scorpio has to, in its own way, be fearless about? It's always going to be about people. It's always going to be about people, other people. We cannot control other people. Other people have their own lives and other people do stuff to us out of our control. So therefore, the Scorpio thing with other people is to maintain a sense of fearlessness while it deals with other people. Another thing for Scorpio is going to be death. Death is the big one, the huge one, because death is totally out of our, out of our control. It's inevitable, but we can't control it. We don't know when it's going to happen, and we don't. We know it's going to happen. It's, as I said, uh, none of us are going to escape it. But Scorpio has to, in its own way, understand death and make it its friend, become friendly with death. And this is not just death, by the way. This is the endings of all things because Scorpio is about rebirth. And to rebirth, we have to go through a death of sorts. And so Scorpio has to be fearless in the face of death so it can rebirth. Scorpio is about having to go through that tunnel and come out the other side stronger. Sex is another thing. You know, sex, anything taboo, anything hidden under the, the carpet, behind the curtains, behind the bush, you know, anything that we don't, we can't see, anything that is mysterious, Scorpio areas. This is, I need to be fearless in the area of becoming uh, sexually brave. I need to be fearless in the area of be able to, to go into uh, uh, intriguing or intense or spooky situations and I need to hold my own here. I need to not allow myself to get swallowed up. This is Scorpio stuff. This is big, big Scorpio stuff. So the whole thing with Scorpio is about Scorpio can go into these areas and go, yeah, I can go into these areas quite easily. And then what they do is they think if I control these areas, men, that, that, that's it. Then I'm in control. If I can control another person, then I'm going to be fine. If I control somebody on the level of sex, then I'm going to be fine. If I can actually control areas that I can't see, then I'm going to be fine. But you're not going to be fine. That's not Scorpio work. That is dark Scorpio work that will go down the road of something that will blow up in its face. It's very destructive because when you're controlling anything, you are when you're controlling something outside of yourself you are going you're just showing how out of control you are basically because you don't try to control something when you're in control and so it's a matter of being able to unplug unplug the power that she gives anything outside of herself so she can actually start to live 
And so Scorpio is all about being able to unplug the power, you know, to defuse the power of, of other people, of death, of all the things that freak us out, all the things that scare us. So we can actually start to live life. We get reborn, we get regenerated, we get rebirthed, and we start to actually go, oh, wow, you know, you feel invincible. And I can actually get out into life and I can start to eat life and I can start to, you know, go for it in a big, big way. And that's what Scorpio is all about. So Scorpio is about peak experiences. Scorpio is about that feeling of passion and that feeling of being taken to the edge of something. Scorpio will always be pushed to the edge because Scorpio always has to take it to the nth degree. And Scorpio will go through many transformations. There's that Scorpio word. Many, many transformations in that in a lifetime um, for for Scorpio to uh, for, for Scorpio to regenerate. And so this is going to be big for my student, huge for my student, because she needs to be able to come into life in this fearless way so she can actually get on path. Can everyone see? It's in the 10th house. The 10th house, when, you're, when you've got lots of planets in the 10th house, particularly the sun and the moon, you have a mission. You have a mission in life. You have a path to walk. You have something important to do out there in the world. You do. And she cannot, if she's scared, if she's intimidated, if she lets the world, and in her case it could be, if she lets the world intimidate her or authorities intimidate her or her mother intimidate her or her partner intimidate her, these are all things, you know, these are all past life things that will come back into this lifetime, intimidate her and stop her, then she's not going to be able to move. She's just going to be living in the Scorpio tunnel. She's never going to come out of the Scorpio tunnel into the light and start to, to really, really live. Now, people who are pushed to the edge in life, when they come back again, they go, I can't, I really can't live life the way I was, you know. Something has changed, something has happened. And so there is something going on for her now that has to, in her own way, do this in her life. She has to feel like she's going to uh, get pushed as far as she can go to the edge of what of what she can take this particular lifetime now she wants she'll probably she's only 25 she's very young so uh there's a lot of this ahead of her because the 10th and the 11th houses are usually houses that develop as we get older and so earlier on, you might have the feeling of, of all this and you might be excited or whatever, but it, they won't actually start to develop in a big way until she starts to get into her 30s, 40s and 50s. And that's when she'll really start to, to feel all the Scorpio stuff really starting to happen in her life. Her Saturn return, I think, will be, will be a big one. So as a 10th house Scorpio, she needs to be able to, in her own way, go into areas of shadow stuff, dark stuff. She has to go into tunnels. She has to go into intensity. She has to uh, go into uncover things. She has to investigate. She has to become the detective. She has to go into all the areas, all the Scorpio areas. Scorpio has to go through a tunnel. And a tunnel, it doesn't have to be bad and it doesn't have to be scary. But it has to be, it has to, it has to evoke, it has to evoke deep, deep areas inside of them that trigger, that trigger parts of them that they need to look at and they need to address. Now, Scorpio is about truth, absolute truth. And I feel on a certain level she wasn't truthful in the past life or couldn't be truthful in the past life because she was so caught up with security, so caught up with safety, 
so caught up with keeping everything, everything, you know, uh, even and status quo, that that was, you know, that was her main priority. Truth, absolute truth, and being able to to step out of that was too would have been too difficult for her. Would have been too scary for her. Though she had people, strong people, that were that were preying on her or intimidating her or blocking her or scaring her that was making her face something about herself. Now, in this lifetime, she has to, she has to go down into the truth of who she is, the truth of life, the truth of who she is. She has to look unflinchingly at herself on all levels. So this is like a dark, deep excavation of who she is and what makes her tick and particularly what scares her. What frightens her? She has to ask questions like, what is scaring me? What is frightening me? What is frightening me about getting out into life and taking the bull by the horns and living living a life, living every day as if it was my last? And that's what Scorpio is about. And that amount of, of planets in Scorpio are all saying that. I have to live every day as if it was my last. So my mission, my sole purpose my intention has to has to follow that has to follow that whole idea has to follow that that feeling that knife edge feeling of getting out there and doing that kind of work now what kind of work is it it's 10th house what kind of work is it now the the astrology chart does not give you job descriptions the astrology chart is not like the classifieds it doesn't say be an airline you know attendant or you know work be a pharmacist or or be a pilot it doesn't say that it just gives you it just gives you the the the, the vibration it gives you the energy it gives you the nature it gives you something that you need to acquire that will actually be part of what you need for your path and so let's look at the planets that are involved in here because it's scorpio stuff so for her, it is always going to be stuff that feels that feels passionate. And when I see Sun and and Venus together, especially in Scorpio, you know, that's passion to me. That's passion. So she has to be passionate. She has to be passionate about her path. She has to be passionate about her mission. Her intention has to take passion with it. And passion always has something to do, and Venus always has something to do with people. It has something to do with money and value as well. But I feel that there's going to be something about her value and people that work hand in hand, because in the past life, I feel her value was taken from her by other people. And so working with people, Working with people in a passionate way. How do you work with people in a passionate way? You work with people in a way that is uh, transformational. And Venus is always about love. Venus is always about uh, is always about serenity and beauty. And so there's something about her being able to connect with people on a level where she where she can bond and blend and relate. But at the same time, she's bringing out something in them that's bringing out their their life their, their their joy their love their fun you know that's it's venus it's venus in scorpio it's deep it's intense but it's still it still has got this thrill about it it's still thrilling so there could be something in her she, she might be creative she might be artistic and if it's creative and artistic that's definitely going to be a part of it too but I can't help but think that it's actually more than that. I think it's much more personal than that. I think there's something about her taking her power back in this particular area from other people and being the power force of Venus. Everyone see it's it's uh, Pluto uh, Pluto in Scorp uh, sorry uh, Venus in Scorpio and the Sun in Scorpio. So it's powerful Venus. It's powerful Yin powerful feminine energy and so powerful feminine energy is actually in in many ways actually stronger than yang energy and so she can connect to people she can connect to people in that deep yin way and do some major changes for people on that level 
Now, I want to start looking at the, I'll, I'll bring the moon in. I'll bring the moon in now because it, it, it's the moon, of course, as we all know, is a very, very important part of the chart. The moon, um, I can see, is connected also to the Jupiter and Pluto, but I want to talk about the moon separately. The moon squares Mars, and so Mars squares uh, the Venus and the, and the Sun as well. But um, there is something about the moon energy. The moon energy always, the moon energy in all, in, in all of us, uh, is looking is looking for nourishment. You know, it's looking to be uh, to be nurtured and loved and cared for and looked after. And the moon in Scorpio. Here we go. This is a this is an interesting one because how she gets nourished, she gets nourished in a Scorpio way. So when I see moon in Scorpio, I go down the road of healing. I think moon in Scorpio is deep emotional healing. And I don't know what her relationship with her mother is like, but sometimes when you're when the when your mother, the person who's supposed to look after you, and this person who's supposed to care for you and nourish you, doesn't necessarily do that. It feels like you need to be healed. It feels you need to be healed on this level, but you have to go through heavy duty stuff before you get there, if you know what I mean. So mother could have done this to her in some way. I'm not, I don't want to blame anybody. I don't want to blame mothers because she's got her own story, her own chart, and all the stuff that she needs to go through as well. But maybe, maybe there was power issues, control issues, as I said, in the past life stuff and probably in this life in a certain way where she feels that she's missed out. She's missed out on love or she's missed out on that feeling of being wanted or belonging, all those kind of things. Now, she's never going to find it there. You know what I mean? She's not going to go back and find it in mother. It's not going to be there or, or, or family at all. It's all South Node stuff. So she has to turn this one around and she has to use it in her work. She has to use it in her work. It's up there in the 10th house. So moon in Scorpio, when I see moon in Scorpio, as I said, this is a healing energy. So rather than actually going through the feelings of pain and thinking, oh, this is a painful part of my chart, it's not. It's exactly the opposite. It's actually a part of you, of her chart where she can actually be a, a, a real deep change agent, again, on an emotional level for people. This is where she can feed people. This is where she can give life to people. This is where she can change people, resurrect people, transform people, all that kind of stuff. But she has to do that for herself first. Um, I don't. I want to. I want to go down some kind of healing road or something to do with healing in a healing capacity. Now it doesn't have to be. You know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily have to be classical healing, but it, it feels to me like there is something there where her heart, where her soul, where her heart is invested in something along the lines of helping people through pain, you know, that can come into it as well, or helping people through uh, 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 through times of where they've felt, where they've felt disempowered or where they've felt overpowered because can everyone see it is squaring the Mars here? I can't help but think that there's something about the Mars energy that she is trying to, in her own way, work with. She needs to work with this energy, this lifetime. Any pain that she got from the seventh house before, she needs to turn around and put out there in the world. She needs to be a helper and a healer of any energy of people who've been brought down, you know, who've been who've been taken, who've been taken to the to the to the nth degree, who's been taken to the bottom, that kind of feeling. Now, staying with Mars, everybody, staying with Mars, this is an important part of her chart now. Because she has to become the Mars in Leo. Because if she can become the Mars in Leo, all those Scorpio planets up there in the 10th house are all going to light up. They're all going to light up because that is going to be the main reason that stops her from getting things going. And so she needs to become Mars in Leo. 
But, you know, people would go, oh, does that mean she has to go into relationships and start being aggressive and start bossing her partners around? No, no, not at all. Though a lot of people would say, oh, steer clear of her because she's got Mars in Leo in the in the seventh house, so she's going to be a bit of a ball breaker. Um, but, you know, not necessarily at all. Uh, it's been, it's, it was a part of her that, that she uh, was damaged by in a past life. She was damaged by aggression of sorts by a partner. So now she has to come into her own as Mars in Leo. So she has to Mars in Leo herself first, meaning she has to become strong. She has to become independent. She has to become assertive. She has to hold her own. She has to have the warrior archetype within her to start off with, not in an aggressive way, but in a nobody pushes me around way. And then in Leo, she has to realise her specialness. She has to realise her value. She has to realise her importance. She has to realise that she matters. Now, these are all things that she has to do for herself because this was taken from her in the past life by somebody else. So she needs to be able to come into her own on this level because if she goes into relationships without this, chances are she will she will bring in a Mars in Leo person again, you know what I mean, and play it out for her. So she has to become this before she gets into relationships. And if she can become this before she gets into relationships and then moves into relationships as a Mars in Leo person, then not only is she going to hold her own within relationships and not get pushed around in relationships, but Mars in Leo, Leo is a very generous sign when it works well. And this is about actually being the, 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 the initiator or the giver uh, or, 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 or a person who can actually be, uh, again, a, uh, uh, a, an enthuser or an empowerer or an encourager in relationships. Now, she can actually do this in personal relationships. She can actually build the relationship up in that kind of way and have both parties feeling good about who they are. But on another level, because it's connected to her work, I can't help but feel that this is going to be part of her work. This is going to be the way she deals with people and the way she, I, I, I think with Venus up there with the sun, I can't help but think a lot of her work is going to be through people and with people, relationship style. And so I feel, and when the moon's up there as well, I feel her strength, her need to be strong, her need to be able to show herself, express herself, uh, Leo style, um, and work with people on that level and be able to take charge and be able to be uh, have that leadership kind of quality with people, not in a bossy way, not in an aggressive way, but in a way, as I said, as, a, as an encourager, as a motivator and a feeling of a person who, who, you, who, who you feel that you can um, uh, bank on, you know, that kind of feeling. That, uh, you know, a person who feels like in the relationship they're not on the back foot, they're actually driving the show. So you get a feeling of where she's at at the moment because this is something that she'll be dealing with on the level of all her relationships. All her personal relationships will bring this up in her. She could easily fall back into her self-node and play very, very safe and just marry somebody uh, safe, but at the same time, marry somebody safe, but still holds holds it over her, and she doesn't be the person that she's with doesn't have to be aggressive. You know what I mean? They, you can you can have somebody very willful who stops you from doing things without being aggressive, and she would have to be very very careful to not allow that to be part of her life. So her need now her mission and everything to do with her path and getting on path and becoming uh, uh doing doing her doing her her work her major work out there in the world is going to rely on how well she does the mars in her relationship world and then of course bring that into any kind of work she does with other people as well so i've got to move along a little bit I'll leave Saturn until the end. I want to talk. I want to talk about um, the two planets in the twelfth house and their um, their trine over to Chiron. 
Now, there's Ven sorry, there's uh, Uranus and Neptune. Uranus and Neptune is a signature of the early 90s generation, the millennials. Uh, Uranus and Neptune came together for the first time in 170 years in the very early 90s. Well, they stayed together throughout the 90s, but the early 90s, they were very, very tight. Uh, Uranus, of course, went into Aquarius a bit later on. Even late 80s people have got them relatively close, but the early 90s people have this signature. So this, this was the time when everything changed as far as the internet was concerned. This is when the internet was born commercially. And you can see the Uranian energy of technology and the, the Neptunian energy of everything going viral at that time, which changed the world on that level. And all the millennials were being born at that time. And I truly believe that these are the people come, they're all coming up to their Saturn returns pretty soon coming into their 30s and 40s, these are the people, hopefully, they're going to do some major changes in the world. Now, Uranus, Neptune in the 12th, tells me that there's a real loss of freedom for her in the past, which, which, which is Uranus, and a real loss of any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, release, letting go, uh, spiritual outlet, you know, that kind of thing. It feels, can you see the past life energy had none of that whatsoever? It was all very, very spiky. It was very sharp. It was very prickly. It was very scary. And it was all about hanging on and holding on and keeping safe and secure. So Uranus and, and uh, Neptune is exactly the opposite to that, isn't it? It's the freedom, the freedom of the spirit, the freedom of the spirit the freedom to be able to get out and be who you are, be be authentic, be what you want to be, and be able to be uh, free enough to, to colour outside the lines and to buck the system. And Neptune has that feeling of being able to release, let go, surrender, and trust something that's going on deeply within you. And so it's in the 12th house for her. So there's a major need for her now with those planets in the 10th and the 11th, and I haven't talked about Jupiter and Pluto yet, um, there, is, uh, there is something going on with these planets that are telling her that her life and what she has to go through in her life now is bigger than her. It's bigger than her. That's why she's got such a strong, uh, strong uh, fourth quadrant, because who she is in the world and what she has to do out there in the world is actually more about causes or projects or, or, or teams or ventures or visions that have more to do with how she's going to impact the world, as how she's going to come into a, a, a place of change, a place of of pushing things forward, a place of transformation, a place of regeneration, a place of rebirthing, all those kind of things for for the people, you know, it's a it's a it's it for the community, for for something grander, for something greater than who she is. Now you get that feeling of uh, that she she needs to recognize that. So she needs to go in and do some what I would call she would need to to have some kind of uh, uh, spiritual alignment, some some kind of way of becoming spiritually aligned, whether it's through meditation or whether it's through any kind of holistic healings or whether it's just through what she needs to learn. All those kind of things are going to be super, super important to her. Being a, an astrology student, of course, is going to be a big part of this. You know, as being an astrology student will really turn things around for her and change her. Can everybody see that it's in trying to Chiron over there in the ninth house? The ninth house of learning and the ninth house of travel and expansion and faith and belief. And, you know, so the high side of this, Chiron in Virgo, makes me feel that's the teacher healer of the bigger, of the bigger story, you know, the bigger picture stories. Uh, Virgo goes down the road of doing it in a in a tutoring kind of way, a coaching kind of way, rolling up her sleeves and teaching the practical way of doing things, putting things together, um, and 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 a, a feeling of of her having to get over her Chiron wound. Her Chiron wound, when you look at Chiron in Virgo, in the ninth house. 
There could be something about missing the forest for the trees here, don't you think? The ninth house is the forest, you know, and Virgo caught up in the trees, you know, not being able to see the big picture because it's caught up in the detail, worrying about the bits and pieces, worrying about the nitty gritty and not being able to understand things on a much, much bigger level. There's also a pain, there's also a wound around there is so much to learn, I'm never going to know it. I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to know enough. I'm just going to have to keep on learning. Virgo style, you know that feeling? I'm going to have to keep on learning. Um, I'm not bright enough. I'm not intelligent enough. I'm not inspirational enough. All those kind of things. I'm going to have to keep on learning. I'm going to have to keep on studying. I'm going to have to keep on going. And probably I will never get there, you know. That's the Virgo in ninth house pain. That's the wound. I'm thinking I'm never going to be the 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 uh, uh, the the teacher I want to be, but the whole thing with this is Chiron is the teacher healer. It has to get over itself. Everyone going back over to Uranus Neptune. It has to get over itself. It's not about her. It's about how she can impinge on other people, how she can affect society, how she can affect people on a spiritual level. And this is her sole work. This is her sole work. So there's a teaching thing going on here. It is also in square to, this is uh, uh, Uranus and Neptune, is also in square to her Mercury, everybody. Everyone see her Mercury? Mercury in Libra. Mercury in Libra in the 10th. Isn't it interesting with all the Scorpio, all the Scorpio planets, she's got a Libra planet. Mercury in Libra wanting to wanting to talk, wanting to communicate, wanting to, to teach, wanting to understand, wanting to, to get their voice out there again, out there in the world in the 10th house in a Libra way, in a balanced way, in a peaceful way, in a fair and just way. Needing to, needing to get her point across without causing too many ripples, so to speak. But, you know, the, uh, Libra, the Libra energy has to, in its own way, has to get over being nice and wanting to or everything to be peaceful and everything to be calm. It needs to be in there. It needs to be able to connect. It needs to be able to get out and talk to people and be able to relate. And it needs to be able to bring, bring some form of balance and equilibrium into people's lives through her work. And that's what she needs to be able to do. She needs to be able to find that peace and equilibrium within herself. But it squares, everyone see, it squares her Uranus. See, the Uranian and Neptunian energy wants to kind of break things up, wants to break rules, wants to colour outside the lines, as I said, wants to actually free itself, move itself outside of the norm. It doesn't want to play in that area anymore. It doesn't want to play good. It doesn't want to uh, it doesn't want to uh, be be told what to do. And so what she has to do here with the with the Neptunian with the uh, with the uh, the uh, Mercury, Sorry, I was getting a bit confused there. Uh, with the Mercury energy in Libra, she has to actually get this the, her message across, as I said, for people in a balanced way, but she has to do it in a way that's evoking something, that's evoking people, that is, that's evoking people in a way where they can actually uh, see a vision of their life that is not necessarily going to be what everybody else agrees with or not necessarily falls into line, or not necessarily is normal, you know, that kind of thing. So a feeling of being able to be personable, a feeling of being able to be to be understanding and diplomatic, but letting people know that their lives are more than just the everyday boring, nitty-gritty, paying bills, going through the motions. That there's so much more that, that 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 they have that they have a sole intention. They have something that they've come here to do, and it's much much more exciting. It's much bigger, and it's much more important than just trying to survive. So let's uh, let's look at the Jupiter and the Pluto. And this is a big one because this is one of those one of those 
we've actually got these two in the sky conjunct as we speak. In the 11th house, it's part of the stellium, but I can't help but pull these two up away from the stellium because they're more into the 11th house, of course, than the others. But I feel that they, 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 they work as a team, a party themselves, and I feel that this is a big go big or go home kind of part of her, her chart. It's a powerhouse couple. Pluto and, and, uh, and, and Jupiter, it's a powerhouse couple, particularly in Scorpio. So the 11th house, you know, the house, the house of, of groups, of teams, of organisations, of clubs, of getting out into the world and making a difference, making an impact, being socially conscious, you know, having a through line, uh, having a direction, wanting to change things, wanting to mix things up and wanting to be around people, wanting to ally with people, wanting to have friends who support, who are on the same page. And so there's a feeling now of this person needing in their own way to really to really put the, the fire in the belly of something. And this is in her own belly, of course, but it feels like more, a little bit more like a project or a cause or something like a venture or a vision where she is going to really um, really open open things up in a big way. It feels like the, the, the Jupiter energy, you know, the Jupiter energy of expansion and the Jupiter energy of, of vision and promise and optimism and luck, if you want to use that word, comes into this where she feels confident in this particular area. But Pluto takes it down another road. Pluto takes it down a road of intensity. You know, Pluto really, really spikes it. Pluto really puts it in an area where she feels on a certain level that this is not just romping out there, you're not romping in the, in the paddock. This is deep, this is deep stuff. This is deep, train, change worthy, transformational, regenerating, rebirthing stuff that has to happen here. And so any groups that she can, she can be part of or she can form or any organizations that she can be or, or that, she, or people that she can team with where this kind of work is going on, this deep transformational work around opening up new areas of life, learning more, uh, becoming becoming much more, um, uh, not, I want to say educated, but it's not even about education. It's about, it's more about a belief or, uh, or a trust or a principle in life or, or your own personal laws, you know, those kind of things. It feels to me like people need to be able to, to be a part of change in that. Everybody's lives, people's lives are so based, as I said, on just trying to survive, so based on just paying bills and just getting by on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is a feeling of being able to be enterprising or entrepreneurial or something on the level of creating something big and, and, uh, and um, uh, I just get, I, I keep wanting to go down that road of something of something that is that really hits people right between the eyes. Now, she needs to be able to, in her own way, um, get excited about this herself first. You know what I mean? She needs to be able to realize that her impact in her own way on society is so important that this Jupiter and Pluto within herself becomes so um so enthused, become so bubbling inside of her that it has to, it has to find a release. It has to find a release out there in the world in some kind of way. And to be able to be around people who support that, allies who actually are in alignment with that, will be really, really, really important for her this lifetime. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before we go to our question time is Saturn and I've left Saturn to the end only because I think the Saturn in this chart is so 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 important because 
everything that we've talked about up until now feels a little bit like it's kind of gone down a road where they've all kind of weaved together relatively easily, even pulling it, the, pulling the planets into the, the nodal story and pulling them back out of the nodal story and into the chart doesn't seem like things have jarred all that much. Now, I'm not saying Saturn is going to jar the chart, but it's very, very different. It's very, very different from the rest of the chart, and it's interesting because it rules her ascendant. It's in the second house. Now, let's go back to the south node just for a second. South node's in Taurus. And remember, we talked about her past life energy around safety and security and holding on and family and emotional needs and that feeling of just trying to survive. Now, the second house comes into this. The second house, which is all about that, the second house is, is about our resources. It's about our equipment. It's about what we have in life. It's about being able to keep a roof over our heads and pay our bills and feed ourselves and be self-sufficient and to make money. But it's also more than that. It's also about, you know, how we feel about ourselves intrinsically, what we're resourced with intrinsically, what makes us valuable what we have, what abilities, talents, gifts we have inside of us that makes us feel like we're equipped and how we can use them, how we can use them this lifetime to not only make money but also make us feel good about who we are. So here's Saturn, the ruler of her Capricorn ascendant. And as I said earlier on, it feels like an anchor. It feels like this anchors her because even though all those planets up the top of the chart, the Scorpio planets, you know, all the Scorpio planets, even the planets in the 12th, 11th, 10th, they all feel like they all want to get out there and they all want to do their thing. But, you know, they, they, can actually, they can actually turn around and run back. They could easily do that because sometimes with that amount of Scorpio, and especially also with the Jupiter and the, and, uh, the Pluto, things outside in the world may scare. You know, it might be a feeling of, of even the fear of success. You know, all that Scorpio stuff, Jupiter, Pluto out there in the world, scared of their own power, scared of success. What if I fail is always going to be big. You know, that whole Scorpio feeling of something happening and then dying. You know, what if I fail? Fear of success. And so that feeling of all these planets wanting to get out into the world in a, in a very, um, very passionate, very go for it kind of way. Um, she's got to be careful. She's got to be careful of how well she can hold things together. This is where this is where Jupiter, this is where the Saturn comes in now, and she needs to be able to keep everything stabilized. I'm going to say that word stabilized by Saturn, because Saturn is going to be the part of her chart that keeps her on track. Number one, that keeps her strong in herself, self sufficient in herself constantly bringing herself back to I don't need anyone to look after me. I don't need anybody to approve of me. I don't need anybody to prop me up. I don't need anybody to rely on. You know, that satin in the second house, I can look after myself. I've got what I need. I can handle it alone. You know, all these kind of things. This is really important for her because she can actually be fodder out there in the world for all the things that she went through in the past life of people trying to intimidate her, people trying to stop her, people trying to come into her life um, and uh, vex her. And here's the satin in the second. Here's the satin in the second that's trying to hold it together on the level of her self-worth and value, meaning I'm the rock, that feeling of I'm the rock, Nobody, nobody pushes me around that kind of thing. 
I'm good at being able to look after myself. As I said, I can make my own money. I don't necessarily need anybody to come into my sphere and take my power away from me. Now, on another level, she's going to have to be super, super, super careful that Saturn doesn't do the opposite, meaning that Saturn doesn't actually end up being the, uh, the wet blanket of her chart, feeling I don't have what it takes, second house. You know, the limitations, the restrictions of Saturn in the second house. I've got to work hard for everything. I've got to work hard for money. You know, I've, my, my self-worth is, 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 is just based on the amount of, of effort or the amount of, of concentration or, or the amount of hard slog I put into something. I don't get anything back without all that involved. Now, I'm not saying she doesn't have to apply herself. She's definitely going to have to apply herself. She's got uh, Capricorn on the mid uh, on the ascendant, so she's good at applying herself. She's good at being able to, to direct herself and keep herself on path and goal-oriented. But she can't, she can't allow that Saturn to actually drag her down and feel like everything is becoming a burden or she's becoming responsible for everything and everyone or everything is becoming challenging and difficult. She's going to have to turn that satin around. And in a reading for her, I would be saying exactly that, that this is her strength. Satin, satin is actually one of her abilities. Satin is one of her, something that's valuable for her. She, satin is a resource of hers. She's strong. She's got inner strength. She's got resilience. She's got determination. She's got managerial skills. She's an authority in her own right. You know, these are all the positive satin things. And it makes a trine up to her, up to her uh, Venus and her son. And so if her Venus and her son want to get out into the world and connect with people in a passionate way and be able to deal with people as far as love and heart is concerned, then she is going to need in her own way, she's going to need to, to really, really understand and strengthen her own value system down there in the second house before she can teach anybody else about it. Venus up there in the tent. So I'm going to have to, I'm just going to have to pull it in there, guys, because we are at 10.30 and I do want to uh, want to take questions now. So I, I hope that made sense. Uh, I hope if you were, do, if you were uh, uh, getting that in a reading or getting something like that in a reading or being able, you guys being able to, to put that out there in a reading, that the client would really, really benefit uh, a hell of a lot from uh from what the chart had to say so any questions wow that was fantastic thank you mark um really juicy and exciting <laughs> what a passionate and profound chart and uh the owner of this mystery chart has just revealed herself in the chat window hi jesse thank you for letting us use your chart today um, fascinating and such great learning. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Jessie said she's curious about the Pisces Saturn. Jessie, for Saturn in Pisces, um, see, Pisces might soften the Saturn a little bit, but it's hard to soften Saturn. Saturn's quite hard, so it, <laughs> it doesn't get softened all that well. But, you know, I find with, with Pisces energy, Pisces energy disperses itself. So the Saturn energy will disperse even stronger into the chart. So I want to say that the Saturn might actually go down the road of being able to be stronger on a level of, of soul or spirit. You know, that's another part, you know, finding some spiritual strength going in, into it. But I also feel that the Saturn even might be even more strong with the, with the Pisces energy just, you know, dissolving it into into the 12th into the second house yeah uh Jean has just said um what a wonderful chart you've chosen for this lifetime i totally agree jesse um this is a this is an evolutionary fast track um it's yeah it's it's, it's big isn't it it's full yeah, on it's the opposite to beige yes <laughs> <no> beige here <laughs> 
Fantastic. So, yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Um, Peter V says, um, is the Past Life mini course suitable for beginners? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it would be helpful if you'd know um, uh, planet signs houses. But um, Yeah. Yeah, yeah you've, got to, you've got to know your planet signs houses. Um, yeah, so if you know your planet signs houses and you basically understand what the what the nodes are about, I will go definitely go through uh, through the nodes in the very first class. But you have to know your planet signs houses for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the Ray B says, um, "Will we get a copy of this chart um, for further study and reference?" Yeah, I mean, just email me and I'll and I'll send it to you. Yeah. Fantastic. Mark at marklawrenson.com or Sydney Astrology School at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, Maria asks, uh, would you call the North Node, South Node square with Mars a T-square and does it act as a T-square? Yeah, it is a T-square. It's a T-square um, and it, when you've got a planet T-square in the nodal axis, it becomes super important because it's, you know, part of, of something that happened to you in a past life that kind of got in your way in a past life. In this particular lifetime, it becomes crucial for you to uh, to uh, develop uh, in a positive way. Mm. Um, Maria also asks, um, how does the North Node being between the sun and moon um, affect the new moon in Scorpio? I guess the fact that she's a new mooner. She's a new mooner. Yeah, do you, do you interpret the, the new moon differently? Um, yeah, I mean, I probably wouldn't go into that in the reading because there's so much more going on in the reading. Um, but she is a new mooner. And so new mooners are always, for me, it always feels like uh, uh, I don't want to say that, that that Jessie's trying this out for the first time because, you know, we've, we've all been around forever. But I feel that I feel that really getting into all that Scorpio energy, which, as I said, played against her before, this is this will be new territory for her this lifetime. It will be. And so the new moon kind of just underscores that. Awesome. Uh, Christiana says uh, the node that last made a conjunction with the Mars is, is the south node. Um, so the resolution in this life will be through the south node question. So in order to go to the North Node, she will have to redo the South Node to be a note to be emotionally self-sufficient, Taurus in the fourth. Is that correct? Are you saying that um, to go back to the South Node again and get the South Node together, replant the South Node, she's going to have to do a lot of Scorpio stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for her to feel truly, for her to feel really safe. For her to feel really comfortable and for her to come home to herself and belong and feel like, ah, oh, you know, that lovely tor real Taurus feeling, that lovely tor serene Taurus feeling, she's going to have to do her reboot. She's going to have to go through her whole stuff around around having to, to deal with her power issues and deal with issues around uh, the world and and. and people in the world playing around with her power. And then once she's unplugged all that, how good is that going to feel? That's going to feel so safe and so secure that she can actually start to feel, you know, very, very uh, uh, everything at the bottom of her chart really starts to become much more stable because of that. Yeah. Uh, Jesse's just saying in the chat window, I find it interesting. I have a Venus, uh, a Leo in Venus, Sorry, Venus in Leo partner, um, Sun Taurus. Uh, he teaches me to do Taurus well too. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Uh, we've got a, actually, just before everyone goes, I'll paste, I promised at the beginning, I'd paste um, in the chat window the first of this series, um, the one that I mentioned that was on Nadia Char Shah's channel. Um, so very similar to today. So if you weren't there for that one, um, check it out. Uh, we've got a question from Frankie. Uh, can you please discuss how you explain a planet in a house in a different sign to that house? For example, Mars in Leo in the seventh, ruled by Cancer, especially 
when there may be an emphasis on Mars, the only fire sign, even though um, it's a house ruled by water sign? Yeah. Well, it's it's both. It's both, Frankie, because the Mars, the Mars in Leo I would spend more time on. Uh, that would be what I'd be talking about the most in a reading. But as I said, she's got cancer on the cusp, and so the moon rules cancer. And it was over there in Scorpio in the um, uh, over there in Scorpio in the tenth. So I, I mentioned that there was a connection between her relationship world and her work world, and I feel in a way that 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 they come together. Either she works in the relationship area, meaning, or areas to do with what she has to learn about love and bonding and nurturing in in relationships finding that in relationships is going to help her to actually become get closer to uh doing that in her work yeah excellent uh question from peter will you be conducting in the near future a COVID 19 chart <laughs> interesting session not sure about that one because is there a chart for COVID-19? I don't know. Well, I mean, maybe the chart of the, the very first diagnosis, I suppose. Um, I don't know if I'm actually going to be doing a, a whole webinar on it. No, no. But uh, lots of people are talking about it and there's lots of stuff going on on the net and on Facebook and lots of astrologers are, are very into it. So I'm sure you'll find what you're after. Yeah. And this is all on the back of the um, Pluto-Saturn conjunction on the 12th of January. Um, even though COVID hadn't reared its head, I think um, this whole year will be held by that conjunction. It's a major happening. Um, so, yeah, as Mark said, there's loads of talk yeah. about in astro circles. Um, would you also look at the influence of the eclipse on her chart too? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. But I didn't see if I brought that in, it, you know, we would have been here for another half an hour or at least, you know. So, yeah, I had to I had to tailor it down. But, um, yeah, it was an eclipse. Yeah. Um, sorry, Peter V is just asking for the link to that um, past life mini course again. There you go, Peter. Awesome, guys. That's going to be really exciting. I um, hope to see you all there. Uh, the nodes, as we all know, are a fascinating part of evolutionary astrology. And, um, yeah, there is quite a bit involved in constructing the nodal story. Um, so, yeah, after five sessions, you guys will be well-versed. Um, Caitlin says, my son has near the same chart. Oh, okay. Born. And Caitlin. Yeah. So this is November, November 4, 1994. Yeah. Brilliant. Wow. Well, I think that is everyone's question. I'll just, yeah, I think we've covered all of the questions. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. And um, I'll just mention um, the feed, the, um, the input in this class has been incredible. Um, some really great points you've all made. Um, thanks, everyone, for contributing. Yeah, I saw lots of people writing stuff as I was talking, but I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't look over because otherwise I'd get too distracted. But That's thank you all so much for participating. Um, and uh, we, will, we will do another one, but uh, I'm, more, I'm more focused now on the Past Life mini course. I think that will be really, really exciting. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone. It's gorgeous to see you all. Thanks for coming. And thanks, um, everybody. Take care during this time and um, use it to study your astrology. <laughs> see you guys.